don't want to speak. As, um, I don't want to speak as any kind of um, expert. I just want to speak as myself. Um, so the um, the first thing that I that I wanted to talk about is um, the fact of the landscape as home. Um, you probably all know the um, the idea of you know the derivation of the word ecology, which is from oikos in Greek meaning home, and I think this is a really crucial um, way to thinking about particular landscapes um, landscapes around you um, around us, and um, this this is also I think. To, it's very much to do with the kind of story of place. It's to do with what what landscapes do, as Isabel was saying, when landscapes shape us and we shape them. I was particularly picking out when people were talking that idea of kind of um, community building and learning from the land, um, and also kind of you know bringing people together in ways that don't otherwise happen in our kind of siloed world. The voices of particular places, the voice of the dark, which is a lovely expression. I don't know much about your project as well, but it sounds so beautiful. Um, so that that's my kind of way into talking about it, first of all, is to say this is our home and that, that it's a very, un, that our contemporary society is very peculiar in thinking that um, all that happens in our lives happens indoors and it happens with a small number of people who are our direct family or our direct friends and that the that and that that our lives are things that take place in those kind of like interior spaces because for so much of humanity our lives have taken place in the home which is um, the immediate outdoor locale. Um, the word kith, by the way, which um, when I was writing about nature and childhood, I wrote a book called Kith, The Riddle of the Childscape. And the reason I wanted to use that word is because in that phrase kith and kin, is that it's usually treated as if we are as if we're talking about um, the same thing. So our kith and kin is like, you know, all rabbits, friends and relations in the Beatrix Potter books. And it's kind of somehow that it's, it's, it's all to do with our human relations. And actually <clears throat> the, one of the original meanings of the word kith is actually the kind of the local home place around us. And the, that is the living world, it's the natural world. Um, and I want to tell you just because it's only just happened and these things are particularly poignant when they've only just happened is that I came into this meeting this afternoon having gone on a walk which which is pretty much next to my house and it's one of my favorite walks and I saw something like that I have never seen I must have walked that particular field 500 times maybe maybe more um because I've lived here for so long um, and I saw a tiny, tiny, tiny little field mouse, and it was two feet away from my wellies. And I couldn't believe that it was, I mean, I was really still, believe me, but it was just sleek and perfect. And it was like, you know, I mean, it sounds a bit kind of, um, sounds a bit sentimental, but it genuinely was like meeting this tiny, cute little friend that I had never met before, who was part of my kith my you know my home so so what is it that we do to kind of make these stories and to remember these stories to and to, and to create ones of our own um one of the things that i'd say is just always remember this is your home it's intimately your home so swim there take off your clothes and jump in if you if you like me get too cold so get a wetsuit jump in um cook there sleep there I mean, really actually sleep there is kind of when, you know, when you walk on the land around, you find places that are good to sleep on. Take other people there, invite people to it as you would to your home. So find places that are the right places to watch the sunrise and the moonrise and the sunset and invite people that you know and invite people that you don't know. And if you see people passing, invite them 
as well, just to sit with you. Some, some of, I know that um, some of the ways that often when we're kind of thinking about these things, it can end up feeling as if we have to kind of like have, have very strict and certain projects. But I would say also that some of these things work incredibly well when it's just like saying to people, you know, do you know that footpath? It's really lovely if you meet somebody on a particular track to say, well, do you know the other one that goes from here? Um, all of the things that, that we would do in our own indoor homes, we can do in our outdoor home as well. It's like make sculptures with dead wood. You know, go for walks at full moon, go for night swims, go for midnight feasts. This, this is all part of kind of, you know, in a way addressing the sense that we are collectively cut off from the living world of nature. And one of the best ways of refuting that is to say it's mine. I'll share it with anybody, but it's mine. <laughs> and so, you know, the public footpaths, they're yours, they're ours. The bridleways, you know, kind of, you know, bike on the bridleways, use them and very, very much invite other people to do the same. Um, the, um, the one of the obvious kind of corollaries of this is that what it makes us think about is the necessity for protecting it, is that these places are um, um the, you know the more they're used the more they're loved and the more they're loved the more they are protected um so one of the ways in which i'd kind of ask you to think about how um there is a sort of cultural knowledge everywhere is this idea of the song lines which was um, made particularly famous by Bruce Chatwin talking about Indigenous Australian song lines although I can tell you for a fact that a lot of Indigenous Australians are really really pissed off with him because they basically thought that what he did was he came along and he kind of like creamed off the idea of the song lines as an aesthetic thing without actually um, saying what they mean for indigenous cultures, which is that um, it's it's much more to do with law, L A W, that the song lines are to do with how you treat the landscape. Um, so, um, so that idea of the song lines, for those who of you who might not be familiar, I would just sum it up by saying it's where the in, for indigenous cultures in Australia, they imagined that the ancestors had walked the land and they had sung the land. So there, there is music which will follow the lines of the land and the songs that will follow the lines of the land. If you know the songs, you can cross land that you didn't know before just by remembering the songs because the songs will mark the precise landscape that um that that you might that you will find there the these songs also demonstrate what are what are some of the moral stories of the land of what things happened at certain places that need to be remembered when i was writing my book wild and thank you paul for um being so appreciative <laughs> that's so lovely i'm sorry for your sleepless night <laughs> <laughs> and um but when i was writing that book i spent um i spent a lot of time in different parts of the world with indigenous cultures very much talking to them about um wildness and wilderness and how they how how those communities see their so-called wild places so for example one of the things that really prompted me with writing that book was to um um, was to avoid what I had seen so many um, so-called wilderness writers doing for decades and decades, which was that they would, um, at that point, tended to be white men doing it. Nothing wrong with being white, nothing wrong with being a man. But the problem was that in that tradition of um, of the dominant culture going into two places, and declaring that it knew what was going on. What tended to happen was that white men would go into kind of 
places that they would refer to as a wilderness or a wasteland. And then they would declare that it was kind of virgin territory. It's so embarrassing. They declare it was virgin territory, that it kind of, you know, that it was these places of kind of, um, of, of pure unspoiled emptiness and all the rest of it. And it was just awful because it's like, because basically what it was, was people who couldn't read the land, declaring that the land had nothing to say because they couldn't, understand what the land was saying so my um impulse right from the beginning was that what i wanted to do was to talk to the indigenous people who lived in the places that i was going to go to and really try and take my cue from them which is not to say that you know that um that i was the expert it was to say that i was willing to be a messenger um, in so far as I could, and I'm not saying that, you know, that I always understood things perfectly or anything like that, but that at least was my ambition. One of the things, one of the results of that was that although I knew before I went about the songlines in Australia, what I didn't know, but I feel I can tell you now, is that um, I just kept finding versions of the songlines everywhere I went. And one of the loveliest was in West Papua, which, um, was is a place one of the most extraordinary places i've ever been to the i walked in the highlands in west papua it's one of the most beautiful one of the wild one of the places where the natural world is so wild um it was also um a place which was very um very moving because the indonesian military had invaded 50 odd years ago, and there has been a genocide ever since. It was a very underreported genocide. Um, and um, I wanted to talk to Papuan people and their experience of their landscape and their experience of the um, absolutely savage, barbarous way that they'd been treated. The Indonesian military had basically gone in in order to take the land for Western corporations, the extractive industries, um, which is why the Western nations, Britain was big amongst them and America and Australia. Why we, in quotes, hadn't done anything about the invasion is because our companies were profiting so massively from it. So I was in West Papua, there was a genocide, and um, I was also so um, moved by the, um, the Papuan people themselves in a way where, which I hadn't really expected, which is that they were singers. Everywhere they went, they sang. That we would be walking, I, I was with Papuan guides <clears throat> because otherwise I would have died of lostness and hypothermia and, <laughs> and loneliness probably and all sorts of other things. Um, and so that the, the best and loveliest thing to do and the most necessary was to be with Papuan guides. And so we would walk from village to village in the highlands um, and they would sing everywhere. They would sing the stories of that land. They would sing the stories of where people had crossed the really high passes they would sing the stories of people who died crossing the high passes they would also sing the stories of that day so there was for example at one time when two of the guides I was with were very young about 17 18 kind of age young men and um and then the guide who was particularly my translator was older um and was talking to me was could explain things to me and there's one point where these two young guides got really really giggly and they were they 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 were so sweet and so funny with each other um and they would always push each other over and try and set each other on fire and all the kind of things that teenage boys usually do and there was this one time they 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 really they were giggling so much and they were wrapping flowers in their hair and they were singing and I said to my translator I said could you translate that for me what are they singing and this and the guy said uh, yeah they're singing we met the girls in grass skirts today way hey. and so they just sung everything it was like impromptu singing um and what i was starting to realize was that that they were threading the land with song everywhere they went and when we got to the villages the villagers would be singing the villagers would sing songs of history the saddest songs of what had happened in the genocide and they would also sing silly 
daft songs and they would sing love songs just like what, what the Papuan leader in exile, Benny Wender, who lives in Oxford, Anthony may know him, um, others if you might, is that, um, that what Benny Wender calls village songs, Benny is, um, was imprisoned and tortured um, for his um, work as a Papuan leader. So he is now leading from exile in Oxford. Um, and he's a singer himself. He, so he, Benny um, is very typically Papuan in that sense of like um, a devotion to freedom and a devotion to the songs of the land which make the land richer wherever you, wherever we are. So just to move ourselves back a tiny bit from the grand world of Papua um, to another landscape where I would also say there are song lines in the, um, in the Amazon, shamans talk about the songs that the plants sing, that there are songs that each plant knows and if you want to learn how to use that plant, you learn its song and it comes to you in dreams, they say. So this is another way of kind of thinking about songs threading the land everywhere. And one of the things that I'd say um, for us non-Indigenous people is that I think that there, there can be such a sense of like, um, oh, we've lost it. They have it and we've lost it. And I think it's a very complicated issue, but I think it's incredibly important is on the one hand, is that to recognize that indigenous cultures have a great need and a great reason to, um, to hold that term indigenous as their own. There's a, there's a lot of international law um, um, which, which they need in order to protect their cultures and their land, that they need to be able to call themselves indigenous. And I really respect that. And it's really important. And at the same time, I also think that there's something which, which, which is really important about any human being being able to say, I belong here. I belong on the earth. Um, I, I, belong singing the stories of this land without in any way um, operating any form of um, um, cultural appropriation by using that word indigenous. It's incredibly delicate, but I, I, I really do believe that as, in, as human beings, we are indigenous to the, to, to, to the earth. And I think, that the idea that we have only lost um, a kind of indigenous sense is quite problematic because it leaves us feeling more and more exiled when what we need to feel is more and more belonging. Um, I also think that part of the complication that really has to be addressed is this idea that you can only belong in a landscape if your ancestors are from here and I'm like, no, no, this, this can be so, so problematic because what does that mean? It means that, you know, that, that if, you're, if you're black and British, you don't belong here. And I can't accept that. I simply can't accept that. That there's, a, there's a, such an uncomfortable um, way of... Um, people looking at belonging to say well you know my ancestors are in this churchyard you know my kind of you know my blood is from here and I'm kind of going yeah, 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 yeah. this is really really complicated because you start talking like that and you end up with blood and soil and nobody wants that so it's extremely complicated but I would say the way out of this which is kind of sweet and simple is knowledge is that when anybody knows a landscape, then they do belong there. It's knowing it. It isn't the fact that you've got certain, you know, Irish blood or, you know, or Portuguese blood or kind of this blood running through your veins. It's do you know that landscape? Do you cherish it? Do you love it? Do you protect it? That is how we belong. 
and when I'm talking about song lines and you know this kind of painful sense that we seem to have you know the the, the cliche is we've lost our song lines we've lost our belongings and I, I would say that one of the first things that we can do is listen is listen to what the particular plants are saying and again I don't mean this as in that there's a right and a wrong and that somebody can hear it and somebody else can't. I just mean that we're all human and that means we're all sensitive. And it means that we all have a chance to suggest what a particular song might mean, what a particular kind of, what, what the meaning of a particular animal in a particular landscape is. And the way that kind of culturally and collectively these things run is that um, the good ideas will stick. It's like the best songs will stick, that the, the best kinds of stories will, will stick. Um, the song lines can be built up of experiences. They can be built up from the simplest experiences of like, yes, this is the place where a group of us decided that we were going to go for a midnight swim, which I did a few months ago um, with friends of mine. So there's one lake which for all of us will be forever associated with one particular midnight swim. And it took us two hours to walk there. It took about two minutes to swim there because it was so cool. There's another lake that for myself and a different group of friends will always be associated with skating one moonlight night. It, it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, these, so, and these things start to come down through, through our kind of recollection. And then, you know, some of us have told the kids and the kids have kind of gone, I want to do that. There was that time, wasn't there, when, when you know, when Anna and George and Jay and Hannah went skating on Marsh's pool. Did you really do that? And so it's like these ways of kind of building up things, the, the ways of, um, you know, finding out, um, finding out what particular plant names are why particular plants grow in certain places this is also where you know that in any group of people you can ask what people's knowledges are so um one of one of the things i'm going to give you an example um from my teaching life because i teach very seldom i teach um maybe two two weeks in a year that kind of thing um often with arvon i have occasionally talked through Schumacher, but very often with Arvon. And one of the things that, um, that I did with a group of students a few months ago, um, which worked, I was teaching writing, it worked to teach writing, but actually it occurred to me, it's a really nice way of being outdoors, making the acquaintance of a particular locale with any group, is that, um, all of us were there as writers, myself and my co-tutor and then the participants. But actually, what we said to people was before we go on this titchy tiny walk, which will give us the knowledge of this place, we're going to give or everybody is going to offer to take one expertise. So there was one woman whose expertise was group dynamics. So we said to her, right, that's gonna be your expertise is group dynamics. Um, somebody else was very artistically motivated. So we said, okay, your job is gonna be, what are the um, works of art that you see in this walk? Somebody else was given the job of um, reading the walk mythically. Um, somebody who could see myth everywhere. Somebody else was a brilliant, brilliant, just straight down the line botanist. So it was like, okay, you tell us, what do you see when you look at the plants? Because I personally, I'm, you know, I'm almost blind when it comes to plants. Um, which is one of the reasons I hate being called a nature writer. It's like, you know, because I really am not good at identifying things. I'm much, much better in the kind of landscape of ideas than natural fact. So we had a guy who was brilliant at botany. Somebody, um, some, somebody else, what, who else did we have there? Um, 
it was oh yes somebody else whose work was a lot with small kids so we gave her the task of looking at the walk through the eyes of a very small child so we did the walk and then we all came back and through these different completely different expertise we built up a knowledge of that landscape so it was like maybe a half hour walk 40 minute walk and we came back with such a dense subtle understanding of a place where we've been through all of these different eyes really so what i would say and this is a bit like kind of you know if it as thinking of kind of the 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 region near to you as home is that if you invited people to a dinner party you would not say that only one person had expertise sufficient to talk you would invite the point of view of everybody and if you were lucky enough to have a three-year-old you would definitely invite a three-year-old into play into the conversation so these are some of the ways in which i'd say kind of you know that the of of um thinking about making you know making that landscape home it's also of course there are all sorts of things to think about like dialect words like what are the kind of dialect words for your specific area this is something i'm absolutely sure you will all have thought about already but they can be so interesting and so revealing um also words that have been used in the past for specific things particular animals one of the one of the things that I think is a beautiful way of making a landscape a homescape is um, to consider it as your home, as your commons, um, to consider what it was like before the act of enclosures, to consider what the community festivals were like in that place. And again, I'm quite sure that you know that that you're probably streets ahead of me on this, but it's a really interesting thing that that um, community festivals, which we now celebrate so often indoors, used to be community festivals out on the land. It was the acts of enclosure that actually prevented a lot of the rights of the land and the rituals of the land. I've written about that in a, the first book that I wrote, which is called Pip Pip, A Sideways Look at Time. And there's a chapter in that about the festivals of the commoners on the common land and when the common land was taken away. So a lot of the common festivals were too. But these festivals can come back. It's like they haven't gone. It's like they're not in history. They are, but they're not just in history. They're in us. It's like, so make one up. It's not that difficult. If you kind of like read a whole bunch of things to do with festivals, they're not sort of, um, they're not dead. They can be, they can be brought back to life in an instant is just, you know, to decide on a particular day, celebrating a particular thing, throw in something totally daft, like some kind of, you know, hat wearing usually does it, some kind of, um, some kind of really choice sort of, um, um, put, you know, particular plant of the, of the time or um, a moon of the time or, um, something which binds the land to the moment. Um, I want to, um, while I'm talking about that, I want to just mention to you the um, French revolutionary calendar, which I'm incredibly fond of. It was invented by the French revolutionaries when they wanted to take the calendar away from the church and the aristocracy. So what they did was they renamed all the months <clears throat> according to the weather patterns. So January, for example, was Nivos and Pluvios, which is snowy and rainy. It leads into February, which is rainy and then windy. March, which is windy and then sprouting. April, which is sprouting and then flowering. May, flowering and then meadow. June, meadow and then harvest. I have got it in front of me, by the way. That's why I'm looking down reading it. June is meadow, then harvest. July, harvest, then heat. August, heat, then fruit. September, fruit, then vintage. October, vintage, then foggy. November foggy, then frosty. 
December, frosty, then snowy, back to January, snowy and rainy. But it didn't only rename the months, it also made sure that every single day honoured a particular thing. It might, it often honoured a local, um, a, a local plant or a very small common hand tool. Very occasionally it honoured um, an animal. So for example, the um, today is the 18th of January. A lot of January is minerals. So Mercury is today. Yesterday was gypsum, the day of gypsum. Tomorrow is the day of the sieve. It's one of those days of like a small hand tool. My birthday is the day of the wheelbarrow, by the way, which I really like. So then the day after tomorrow is spurge laurel, the day after that is moss. So, and then in June, for example, um, you might find that the mid-June, the day of the jasmine, the day of verbena, the day of thyme, and the day of peony. So you get a much more sense of like the flowers of that time of year. It's all chamomile, isn't it? Then it's chamomile and roses. So what the calendar does, the French Revolutionary calendar, is it actually takes you through the entire year with honouring some really common things but so the year is absolutely enlivened and one of the things that would be such a beautiful project anywhere you are is to say with a group of people how can you make your own calendar which which says um for this day we're going to honor this and what it does is it really really enlivens the curiosity because you're going to have to come up with 365 of them so it can't all be kind of like you know roses and <laughs> forsythia it's and grass it's kind of you know it's got to be the kind of the full plenitude of the world around you um one of the other things that, um, and again, I'm sure that all of you will have thought of this, is to make your own maps, because I love OS maps, but they're nowhere near good enough. What you want to do is to be able to name a particular rock, a particular tree, um, and give them names. And if somebody comes up with a name that's more popular, then then seed gracefully is because, because the best names will stick. Um, and and the and also the act of naming is the part that is really sweet in this. Is it's it's not the success or the kind of you know the laying down of the law or getting anybody else to call it something. It's it's the impulse. It's the impetus to belong and to belong by naming by celebrating. Um, so um, yeah, before I pass it on to questions just want to run through a couple of other things that um when i'm thinking about this um this aspect of um in a way kind of festivals and traditions don't forget that um traditions can always be invented there's a great book called the invention of tradition um which which really demonstrates how many things that we now think are sort of ancient tradition were totally invented and the thing about it is that what what kills traditions is set, is setting them too harshly in stone what what vivifies tradition is acting them enacting them is kind of um um Sorry, I'm just Kevin Grieg been working on an amazing project. Thank you, Claire. Um, the yeah, is 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 actually kind of creating, you know, creating one's own. Um, and sometimes those can be kind of, you know, fairly public of just kind of making a day to honor a particular tree or, or you know, the lovely idea of well dressing and things like that, or to honor a particular river. But it can also be very personal things of that, you know, that when, um, if the landscape around you that you belong to is truly your home, where is your church? Things like that. You know, I, I have a prayer place um which i go to um it's the place where i had um the funeral for my father was held he died right at the beginning of the pandemic and there was no funeral um and i found it really unbearable and so i made a funeral for one um in the place that i consider my prayer place 
Um, I'm not a believer in any particular um, organized religion. Um, I do, of course, have my own spiritual practice, which no prizes for getting guessing what it is. Um, but whatever your spiritual practice is, you can have an outdoor church. It's like it's the loveliest idea. It's like whatever your community's spirituality is or a kind of mixed faith thing, you can have an outdoor church. Um, on your own, you can find your own prayer place. It's a really beautiful thing to do. Um, and the last thing I'm just I'm going to talk about is one of the ways um, when I have taught writing, and I've often thought it isn't just to do with writing, it's actually to do with um, an attitude of mind, is that and and it can work in any situation, is to um, to go out to find something that speaks to you, um, something alive, but alive could include a river or a cloud or a tree or a raindrop or a rock um, or any other form of life. And then to write about it from the point, from its point of view. So not, not writing as, you know, kind of me, I saying you, this, splurge law or spurge law sorry um this is what you were like to me but actually just trying to do that thing of um self-forgetting trying to step towards this other thing and writing about it from its point of view and thinking what is its story what does it want and there's no right and wrong with any of this it's it's a matter of trying to um trying to allow our human sensitivity to, um, to give voice to landscapes, occasionally in human words, and to say, what, 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 what are the things that um, this creature or this object have within themselves that makes it their own, its own particular self? How does it hear? How does it see? What does it know? What does it know? Um, because the very asking of those kinds of questions um, is a way of um, really belonging in the land. It's also a very beautiful way of giving other people a little riddle of like, you know, to read something back to somebody um, where you don't say what it is that you were writing about. You don't say that. You just say what it sees, what it knows, what it wants, what's its story. And then it can be like a little riddle for other people. So um, I'm going to wrap up now and um, invite questions. Um, and again, with 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 my slight apologies, because I am quite sure that um, I will have been saying things to you that you will have been deeply conscious of for a long time. But please um, jump in and um, um ask away or just comment it doesn't you don't have to force what you want to say into questions i think sometimes these things are actually much better just as discussions and to make your own contributions don't feel you have to ask please that was lovely jay thank you very much we'd like to go first Contribute, comment, anything. Argue, argue back. <laughs> okay, as, as no one's okay. Claire, before you go, I've got a tiny story to tell. So um, apropos of the Voices of the Dark project, which is funded by Southwest Water for saving water, but it's also asking the question, if the river could speak, what would it say? We were very um, heartened to discover when we went to Benford Reservoir that Holly, who is our other Southwest Water contact, had been helping to interview the new head of education for Southwest Water. And she asked this person, I don't know how many people they interviewed, if the water could speak, what would it say? And we thought, that's amazing. Southwest Water's really getting the message. <laughs> that's wonderful. I love yeah. that. That's pretty good. Claire. Uh, 
Jay, thank you so much. That was um, uh, just connecting on so many levels and um, reading a bit about you previously. I'm really, really interested to hear a little bit more about your, uh, uh, your encounter with shamanism and how, how we might bring some of those elements of transition back in a, a sort of ordinary everyday way, if we can, if mm. that makes sense. Mm. Mm. Yes, yes, <laughs> that's a small subject. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. So, yeah, um, I would start by saying that, um, you know, that the, the dominant culture has temporarily mislaid its shamanism. But shamanism was the uh, religion is that you find it absolutely everywhere. Um, and I think that one of the, you know, I, I really don't want to speak as if I'm any in any way a kind of expert. I only know what I've experienced um, and what I've read. But I think the thing is, is that um, that one of the important roles of shamanism is as healers some of that is healing individuals but an awful lot of it is healing societies and healing the relationship between people and um landscapes uh, or, and you know people and i mean none of these words are right landscape is not quite right you know pe between people and the, the surrounding life um i think I think that um, it's it's very difficult because I I I I, um, I find it extremely uncomfortable when there's an element there's a kind of new age element that kind of says you know that um, somebody has um, you know studied as a Navajo shaman and you know and there's a sort of like you know course on urban shamanism that you can do from in a, in a flat in Croydon and I, f I find it very uncomfortable on the other hand I also find it really important that um, that very very quietly possibly very much alone is that um, that that we do try to look at what it is that shamanism might mean that we directly can do and think and um and speak and a lot of that is empathy actually is that um that it's a way um at best a way of kind of self-forgetting and and trying to step across one's own ego towards the experience and understanding of other creatures of other places and other lands I think one of the other things is, is that I would say is that I think it really matters that that people try to understand the world through those kinds of eyes I think it's also perhaps um, useful to say that um, that in my observation, shamanism is not usually something that people do in order to draw attention to themselves. In fact, quite the reverse. Mm -hmm. So that's a probably a not very, you know, a not very simple answer to a very unsimple question. Comments? contributions jay i was struck in your book um <clears throat> that image on your second ayahuasca experience of the panther that you were that, that kind of came to greet you um so i think this is build on claire's question in a way it's like how do you in your practice and i'm you know please say if this is just a crossing a boundary for you but but if you're willing to answer it how, how in your practice do you connect with with a place which is which channels that power um but, but, and the reason i'm asking the question at all is because i felt so 
I felt it was such a radical manifesto, that book. Um, it was kind of a real kick up the backside, wake up. You know, there is this energy here, which we are totally and utterly connected to. And we have to take responsibility for remaking that connection if we're gonna make any, any kind of change. So I think I'm asking what's the, you know, are there any insights around a personal practice which, which you found helpful? Okay. Um, I think one of the things that's difficult about answering it is because um, is because I don't I don't know each of you, so I'm not sure if I can answer something that helps or says anything to each of you. I and and in that sense, if I answer only for myself, it might land badly. But I think I can only answer for myself. And I think two things, well, several actually. One of them is um, that um, I think that term that you used, Isabel, of being in service, I think that's incredibly important, is that, that I think none of this comes happily from an attitude of mind in any of us, which is egotistical um, or exploitative. I think, I think that, that the more that the practice of humility is real, the more we kind of step towards something. I think also an attitude um, of being in service to something greater than ourselves, I think that's really important. I think love is really important. Um, and I think that that sense of um, being willing to practice um, to being willing to practice love is one of the most important things we can do and I'm just kind of slightly um, this this may sound a bit daft but I'm going to tell you anyway which is that um, I had two grandmothers that I love very much and one of them was daft as a brush and she was absolutely wonderful and she would greet everyone and I mean everyone by calling them darling. And it was like, you know, us as grandchildren thought this was hilarious and wonderful. And then what I realized is that I've kind of picked it up myself a bit. And so when I was standing this afternoon watching this little mouse, which was two feet away from my wellies, and I just looked at it and then I said out loud, oh, you darling. And, but the thing is, it's like kind of that, I'm sort of sorry, not sorry, that, that sounds kind of sentimental and a bit daft. And I really don't care because I think that if you look at something like that and you can call it darling, that you will be closer to it and you will care more. Um, and then completely differently, I'd also say there's so much work which is being done at the moment on um, ayahuasca and various um medicines and they are medicines including magic mushrooms that really show that the experience of connect connecting over you know overused word but deeply deeply feeling a part of the natural world that comes through ayahuasca and psilocybin that these things have been horrendously um, undermined and attacked as being kind of, you know, the Christian missionaries call them devilish. They're sort of, you know, they've been outlawed in different ways. But humans have been using these things for thousands of years as a way of really deeply appreciating the natural world and of appreciating it as something that we are part of and only a part of that we're not more important than we're just a part we're a very important part in my view you know but we are only a part there's a wonderful book by michael pollan called how to change your mind that i would really recommend because what how he's speaking about these things is very much from a kind of rather sort of um a relatively conventional um um you know he's he's not a kind of he's not writing from the point of view of flaky hippie 
he's actually really writing from the point of view of um, of a curious scientist who really wants to know, and also is is desperately concerned about the state of the world. So you know, in the, on the one hand, I'd say you know, channel your internal mad grandmother and call everyone darling <laughs> especially if everyone is a plant or a tiny animal um and uh, and on the other hand don't be scared of um really being willing to change your mind with some of the deep medicines mm, very good answer jay anthony since they are all our relations I just wanted to um, pick up a quotation from a wonderful session at the Oxford Real Farming Conference. Was it last week or the week afterwards? Um, so this was a session entitled Nourishment and Trauma, Revisiting the Food System. And I think it was the great Mama D, who said this word indigenous that was imposed by anthropologists. Um, actually, this is about people that just consider themselves relations of all the other forms of life. And she said, you can't farm a relative. You can only cultivate a relationship. And I think that's a beautiful way of looking at uh, our friends that give us food. I just posted on the chat a link that I hope gives you a couple of photographs of the, the wassail we had in Marston on Sunday um, with our new forest garden, which involves uh, some very nice dressing up and silly noises and all the rest of it. It was the most wonderfully joyous occasion. And the word had got around all over the place, 50 people turned up, it was great. So we can recreate, we can reinvent. That's a tradition we've created. Hooray. <laughs> we've got a tradition now. It's gonna happen every year. Anthony, can you write that quote in the chat? Okay. Thank you. That's lovely, Anthony. I was so happy to hear that. The quote and the and the wassail. Thank you. One last question. Then we need to do a tiny um, bit of discussion about what we do in our next meeting. Daniel. Um, hi, Jay. Um, as I said, I'm a professional town and country planner. I spend my life trying to bring everything I connect to into one system. And if it doesn't appear to fit, I probably say that's for another life, delegate that to my children. And I now know why Paul said he lost sleep over this. I'm going to spend a long time trying to bring this into my system because planners perpetually now talk about sense of place. Mm. And you talked about sense of place and they seem to be totally different universes. So if it's the same thing, if it's the same word, why don't they fit? And they don't. And we've got a whole profession, we've got 25,000 of us working on creating, in some sense, a sense of place for other people. And I just think it's completely futile. If you're right, they're wrong. And I don't, this is good. This, I'm afraid I'm going to lose sleep. I, I don't take pills, but I might have to. And so thank you very much. Or thanks, <laughs> thank you, but don't thank you for this, uh, because I like my sleep. Say so sorry, not sorry. <laughs> Jay, thank you very much. That was such kind of food for the soul as well as um, food for thought. It was a really lovely session with you. Um, I've just been dipping into Wade Davis's book, One River, which I'm sure you know, and reading about um, how Edwin Schultz goes to the Amazon and looks for psilocybin, where he actually goes down to Oaxaca. And um, in there, there was a lovely account of how um, the uh, Aztecs and their descendants used different languages for communicating. They had at least four different ways of communicating. So one was words, mm -hmm. spoken words. One was singing. 
One was whistling. Apparently you could have a whole conversation with whistles. And the last one was just facial expression or just bodily expression. So I think this idea that there's only one language that we need to use, that we're taught that in school, you've got to learn the English language and this is what you do with it. I think that is something we're learning to kind of um, not feel so constrained by. The idea that there are other parallel languages that we can start to adopt and speak in, I think is very freeing for us. It also, I know, touches people in different ways, be able to communicate in different languages. So thank you so much for joining us. That was amazing. Very grateful for your time and all the thought you put into this. Thank you very, very much indeed for inviting me and um, good luck with everything and lovely to meet you all. Thank you. I'll thank say you. You're free to go. Bye. <laughs> Bye. And love to your beautiful corner of Wales. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Wow, what an amazing session. That was extraordinary. Thank you so much for organizing that. Who, I mean, Isabel and Anthony, I guess. It's not... really, thanks for Anthony, because you've got this lovely connection with Jay, Anthony. Yes. She's Wonderful. always an inspiration. Thank yes, you, yes, yes. I feel very changed by the experience. Hmm. Well, it's, and so nice to, some of the, so much of what she was talking about is not just exactly what we need right now, but to just move away from the Eat, Pray, Love graduate school of self-branding, you know? <laughs> I completely. Well, she talked about sleeping on the land and my fire region journey started really with my, my walk up to the uh, source of the Thames when I slept in a field just above above Tadpole Bridge, actually. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, woken by the first light and the sun came up as I got into the river and the mist was hanging above it and I turned around and the swan came around the corner. <laughs> and the river temperature and the air temperature were about the same, but it was wonderful to be on that land and to go to sleep on it, get bloody cold and wake up on it in the middle of